Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us again this week. Today we're continuing our look at the book of Joshua. And in chapter 7, as we saw last week, the Israelites were defeated by I because there was sin in the camp. And Joshua had made kind of a mistake. Let's just put, put, put it bluntly. He'd made a mistake in that he did not consult God. Because God would have told him. And then, if you see it, what the Israelites were doing was very practical. They were doing what seemed right. The people didn't seem like they'd be too difficult to defeat. But Joshua and the Israelites failed to do what was spiritual. And we often do that same thing in our life. We do what seems right. We do what just seems normal and practical. And oftentimes we get ourselves in trouble because we fail to do what is spiritual. And it's to our own detriment. Well, as we saw last week, Joshua and the people dealt with the sin and they went to defeat the people of Ai. In other words, the sin was dealt with. And now, as we're jumping ahead this week to chapter 9, and we see a mistake that is made that that seems to be one that we're prone to do at one time or another, and it's not good or it's not healthy, and it's very similar to the mistake the Israelites made in chapter 7. Because chapter 9 again reveals how susceptible we are to act before praying, before seeking God. You see, before we even look at chapter 9, I want to read to you something from Deuteronomy. God had given the Israelites clear and concise instructions on what they were to do once once they entered the promised land. They were to clear out the people of the land and clear them out completely. It says this in Deuteronomy 20, In the towns the Lord is giving you as a special possession, you must completely destroy everybody living there, just as the Lord your God has commanded you. This will prevent the people of the land from teaching you to imitate their detestable practices, detestable customs in the worship of their gods, which would cause you to sin deeply against the Lord your God. You see, God knows what will happen if they keep the people around. God knows that they will continually be a thorn in their sign and will continually lead them away from true and utter devotion to God. And see, it's really no different from us today. Oftentimes, we have those areas that we trip up in, but we allow vestiges of that sin to remain, and and we leave it around. We leave a little bit of this or a little bit of that And then we wonder why we continually fall into the same sin. You see, God was so clear with the Israelites that they were to eliminate it, which is what we should do. Eliminate that which becomes a problem to us and hinders our pure and total devotion to God. You see, so as the Israelites jump into Joshua chapter 9, there's something we see. And there's something I'll I'll highlight just a little bit. But we actually see a couple of ways the enemy goes after us. And this one I'm going to go over just a little bit, but we'll see one in more deeper detail as we continue. It says in chapter 9, verse 1, that all the kings west of the Jordan heard about all that the Israelites had been doing. And these kings of the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Prezites, Hivites, and Jebusites, they heard this. And what they did is they combined their armies to fight as one against Joshua and the Israelites. Pretty upfront, pretty bold, no mistake about it. This army, these armies wanted to fight as one to try and defeat Joshua and the Israelites. See, sometimes it seems more attainable when we can at least see the enemy and where they are coming from. And what's really interesting is this bold upfront ploy by all of these kings. That, that doesn't trip up the Israelites. They get tripped up by this next group of people that we see. These next group of people, the Gibeonites, when they show up on the scene. Deception is the name of their game. And deceive, they do well. Because see, that's really the ploy of the enemy. He tries to deceive us. He tries to deceive his people. It says this in verse 3, when the people of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and I, they resorted to deception to save themselves. They sent ambassadors to Joshua, 
loading their donkeys with weathered sandal bags, old patched wineskins. They put on worn out patched sandals and ragged clothes. The bread they took with them was dry and moldy. I mean, they are really playing this to the hilt. When they arrived at the camp of Israel, they told Joshua, we've come from a distant land to ask you to make a peace treaty with us. Deception. They were not from that far away. But here's the truth about it. Deception is nothing new. It's been a tactic of the enemy since the beginning. And if you really begin to dig down to it, the enemy himself, the devil, was self-deceived, which just might be the most dangerous and scariest aspect of deception. The enemy truly believed he was on par with God and it cost him, cost him dearly. You see deception in the Garden of Eden when God confronts Adam and Eve. What does Eve say? She says, the serpent deceived me. And Paul begins to echo this in 2 Corinthians 11. He says, look, I fear, he's writing to the Corinthian church. He says, I fear that somehow your pure and undevoted devotion to Christ will be corrupted just as Eve was deceived by the cunning ways of the serpent. See, Paul knows what deception does to us. He knows what it can do. This is why he fears it may happen, which I find so interesting in looking at the life of Paul. You, you never see much fear in his life. He's, he's beaten. He's left for dead. He's shipwrecked. He's never fearful in anything I read about. But this, the deception of God's people, he fears because Paul knows deception leads you astray from a pure, simple devotion to God. Pure and undivided devotion and focus to God. That's what it does. Deception begins to lead us astray as we see here in Joshua. In Latin, the word deception invokes the image of an animal being carried off as prey in the mouth of a lion. That is not a pretty picture. It seems pretty serious, and deception seems pretty harmful. Uh, the Greek paints, paints a picture of wandering off course, of literally being misled. You see, so often we allow ourselves to be deceived, and we fall into that trap, and sometimes we even deceive ourselves. Some ways that deception works, it, it begins to lie to us and it begins to tell us that our, our actions don't matter. That our actions don't matter. Paul writes this in, in Galatians, don't be misled. If you begin to think your actions don't matter, right away Paul is telling us you are being misled. That is not true. He says you cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their sinful nature will harvest decay and death, but those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life. You see, deception tells us our actions don't matter. Sometimes we even begin to deceive ourselves by saying, the Bible isn't that big of a deal. It's not that important for me to literally read God's Word or get into it on my own. Jesus, in one of his discussions with some leaders as they're trying to trip him up, he says, look, you, you're mistaken. You don't know the scriptures. The reason you are mistaken is you don't know the, the Bible. And then he goes on and says, not only that, you don't know the power of God. Mm, don't know the power of God. To know the Bible in more than just a surface level, but to literally know it. So many followers of Christ, we, we discount what we can find and what we can glean in God's Word. And I really think the two statements Jesus makes here is a deception we, we easily fall into. We don't know God's Word and we don't know God's power. The more you begin to know God's Word, the more you will begin to know the power of God because it bursts forth from the Bible. Third deception that we begin to fall into is we start to think, who we hang out with doesn't matter. That it's no big deal who we hang out with. It, it doesn't really matter. It's not a big deal. Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians. He says, look, stop fooling yourselves. 
Evil companions will corrupt good morals and will corrupt good character. I know this verse, for some reason, I know I've shared it a lot when I would teach to teenagers and young people. And I know even when I was young, I heard this verse often. Sometimes as we become adults, we think that that verse really is only for younger people. But that is not what it says. It is for young and old alike. You see, it even might be more tricky for us as adults because really there's nobody to tell us who to hang out with and who not to hang out with. I've got five kids and, and there may be times in their lives and the friends they make, I, I kind of warn them. I can pull them back. I am overseeing them because they're in my home. They're in my care. They're in my charge. And so I'm, I'm cautious about who they hang out with. You see, when you're an adult, you're an adult, that, that's gone. You're answerable to yourself, to God. You have a spouse if you're married. They, they may encourage you to be careful who you hang out with. And I'll even take it a step further. In today's age, it's to me much more just about who you're talking on to or talking with face to face. You have the internet. You are with people all over the world that may be influencing you in the wrong way. And, and I'll even tie it down to what, what are you watching? Because it will even begin to influence you. Bad company corrupts good character. If we don't think that's true, Paul literally says you're only fooling yourself. You're deceiving yourself. See, another thing about deception that I've found to be very true is deception, deception doesn't give a straight answer. We may think we're okay, but see, deception doesn't give us a straight answer. It rarely does. Joshua and the people, when they're meeting with the Gibeonites, they ask where they come from. And their answer is this, we are your servants. That's their response. This is a good statement. It's a good answer, but it doesn't answer the question that Joshua and the leaders were asking them. Deception doesn't tell you the ultimate outcome, the choice that you're going to make. If only we could see the end result of the choices we make like God does, it would probably sway us more and more in the right direction. Deception doesn't give you a straight answer. Another thing about deception is it picks and chooses what facts to tell us. The Gibeonites, when they meet with Joshua and the Israelites, they don't mention the defeat of Jericho and I because then Joshua would know that these people are from around here. You see, we oftentimes do that to ourselves. We either ignore or don't admit the truth even to us, we pick and choose what we tell ourselves, which is literally what deception does. And I think one of the scariest truths about deception, deception begins to presume upon God, presumes on God. You see, Joshua and the leaders, again, make the mistake of failing to consult God concerning the situation with the Gibeonites. They presume they know the answer. They presume they know what's right. And this probably is the scariest part. We think we know. We think we know what's best. We think we know what's right and wrong. And we begin to get ourselves in all kinds of trouble. You see, when you presume upon God and really presume upon anybody, you're beginning to take them for granted. And oftentimes we fall into the trap of taking God for granted. We begin to take the grace of of God for granted, thinking it has no bearing and, and it's no impetus for us to change. And we fall into this cycle, if we're not careful, of sin, repent, receive forgiveness, and we do it over and over and over again. Which if you've ever read the book of Judges, you see the Israelites falling into that cycle continually throughout that book. We get in a bind when we sin. We fail to consult God. We cry out and ask God for forgiveness. We receive it and promptly begin the cycle back over again. Don't presume upon God. See, Paul even talks about this when he's writing in Romans 6. He says, look, what do we do then? 
Do we persist in sin so that God's kindness and grace will increase? He says, look, what a terrible way to think. What a terrible thought. We have died to sin. And if we would get that truth in our heart and our mind, it would begin to change the actions that we take. He says, look, we've died to sin once and for all as a dead man passes away from this life. So how could we live under sin's rule a moment longer? The answer to that question is we shouldn't. We shouldn't. See, deception is serious. It's an area we need to be checking on consistently. Joshua and the leaders were duped into believing that these people were from far away. Why? They didn't consult God. They didn't check and receive His counsel. They looked and everything looked fine and dandy. You could say it very simple. They made their decision based on sight and not by faith. And let's just be really blunt. Looks can be very deceiving. All you have to do is look at the life of David when he was anointed as king. Samuel goes to anoint a son from the line and tribe of Jesse. He goes in there, not tribe of Jesse, but from his house. He goes in there and he sees the oldest son and he thinks, well, this is the one. This is the one that I need to anoint. But God says, look, don't judge by appearance. Don't judge by height. Don't judge by sight. He says, I've rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way people, you and I, see them. People judge by outward appearance. But God, the Lord, looks at the heart. That's where it starts. Thankfully, Samuel listens and eventually goes down the line. And he anoints. He anoints David. You see, it says in verse 14, which is the sad part of this chapter. It says, so the Israelites examined, went by sight. But they did not consult the Lord. Do not get yourself in trouble. So again, so the Israelites have made this treaty with the Gibeonites, these people that they literally were supposed to destroy, if you will. God said, wipe all the ites out. So they find out after three days that, you know what, these people live near us. And they show up at the Gibeonite camp. But the Israelites, it says in verse 18, did not attack the town. For the Israelite leaders had made a vow to them in the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. You see, there's something else that you see in this chapter. As I kept looking at it, and I saw a commentary that brought up the beautiful truth that you see throughout chapter 9. You can't help but see this truth. And a beautiful characteristic of God shines through when you look at the Gibeonites. The beautiful, beautiful mercy of God. We serve such a merciful God. I'm going to read verse 24 and 25. The, the Israelites asked the Gibeonites why they did this. It says, We did this because we, your servants, were clearly told that the Lord your God commanded his servant Moses to give you this entire land and to destroy all the people living in it. So we feared greatly for our lives because of you. That is why we did this. Now we are at your mercy. Do to us whatever you think is right. And before I even go, i got to say this about mercy. You see God's mercy throughout Joshua. You realize Rahab and now the Gibeonites are, are the people. They actually live because they acknowledge God. And it's really interesting to look at because Rahab lied for the Israelites Gibeonites, they lied to the Israelites, but they both acknowledged God and they receive mercy. Here's the truth about mercy. As I start off right away, they didn't deserve it. I got news for you. Neither did we. God's mercy is beautiful. You see, in verse 1 and 2, you have all these countries and kings, as I read at the beginning, gathering together to be able to fight against the Israelites. Everybody but the Gibeonites. They laid their arms down. They wanted nothing to do with the battle because they knew it was a fruitless, a fruitless exercise. They knew, as I'll get to in a minute, that they could not save themselves by what they did. 
Hmm. They are much contrasted to everybody else. And they hatched a plan for peace. You see, you have to understand something about the Gibeonites. They were not a weak people. It says in verse 2 of chapter 10, the people became very afraid when they heard about this treaty the Gibeonites made because Gibeon was a very large town, as large as the royal cities and larger than I. And the Gibeonite men were strong warriors. They weren't whips, but they understood that they could do nothing to stand before this God of the Israelites. Mm. Man, it's such a beautiful truth to understand that it's nothing you can do to earn. You simply receive it. You see mercy, you see throughout the Bible, and it has many def definitions. It's compassionate treatment of those in distress. It's to be without defense against somebody. You can do nothing without defense. And honestly, we are like that with God. No defense, yet God Yet God grants us and gives us mercy. And you see it all throughout the Bible. Again, I go back to the garden. Adam and Eve have sinned. They've sinned. Yet God is, they have to leave the garden. He doesn't leave them with nothing. He literally has an animal slain. He slays an animal and puts the coverings over them to cover over their shame. God extending mercy to Adam and Eve when honestly they they didn't deserve it. That's what mercy is. You don't deserve it. You see, how do we make sure we understand this and, and keep mercy a part of our lives? You see some lessons from the Gibeonites as we read that passage. It said they heard. They heard what God had done, the battles they'd won. This led them to the Israelites in the first place. They knew they were in trouble. They had to do something to keep from being destroyed. They heard Secondly, the Gibeonites believed in the statement that they make to Joshua and the leaders. You see a statement of faith. Not only did they hear, but they believed. I'm going to tell you the truth. It can be quite a distance from our head to our heart. But see, the Gibeonites had it. They speak words of faith when they answer Joshua. To be honest with you, they didn't just hear it. But see, their belief made them put feet to it. They literally put feet to what they had heard and showed what they believed, that God is merciful. This all we can do is throw ourselves at the mercy of God. Thirdly, it says, look, they had fear. They had a fearful reverence of this God of the Israelites. And I'm here to tell you, when you begin to fear God in that way, it will drive us to our knees. It drives us to the realization that we need mercy. The Gibeonites know this. They know they need it. Even though they are a powerful people, they throw themselves at the mercy of the Israelites. It's amazing what God does and the mercy He grants to people and to those that fear Him. You see, if you don't fear God, you're not going to fear what might happen. If you don't fear God, you'll just live like you want to. But when you have a holy, healthy fear of the Lord, you understand the truth of throwing yourself at his mercy. And the Gibeonites, and you think about it, so did Rahab. They were willing to renounce everything they'd had. They were willing to renounce everything to be counted among God's people. Mercy. Such a beautiful, beautiful story. And see, now there's two aspects I, I want to hone in on that are kind of difficult aspects of mercy. You, first off, can't earn it. There's nothing you can do to earn God's mercy. It's literally only given to us by God. You see, a mother, story here, about, there's a story told about a man, a woman who was approaching Napoleon seeking pardon for her son. The emperor replied that the young man had committed a certain offense twice and justice demanded death. The woman said, I don't ask for justice. I plead for mercy. Napoleon said, look, your son does not deserve mercy. Sir, the woman cried, it would not be mercy if he deserved it. And mercy is all I ask for. Well then, I will have mercy on your son. You see, we don't earn it. We don't deserve it. You can't. It's nothing you can do about it. 
And see, here's the problem, is we have this tendency to always focus on, like, the negative. I was reminded of this this past week. I, I don't know if you ever remember taking spelling tests at school, but you would get your test back, and if you'd missed one or two or whatever, you would have to copy those words that you'd missed, you know, five, ten times. All you're doing at that point is focusing on what you missed, hoping, you know, that you learn it, and, and it hopes to make it right. You don't even look at the words that you got correctly, but you focus on those you missed. Mm. You do that to make it right. And sometimes we think we have to do that with God. I've done wrong, therefore I must do something to earn His mercy. And we do the same thing with grace, but today we're looking at mercy. Titus says this, When the compassion of God our Savior and His overpowering love suddenly appeared to us in person as the brightness of a dawning day, He came to save us. Not because of any deeds we had done, but only because of His extravagant mercy. We did nothing to deserve it. We did nothing to earn it. It's literally only because of God and His merciful, merciful wonderfulness. You see, there's also another truth that you understand and need to know about mercy. As I just, just glance over it, is it honestly, you must extend it. Not only have we received it, but it's something that we, as God's people, must extend to other, others. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, said, look, God blesses those who are merciful. God blesses you when you are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. It's something that we as God's people should show to others. James, I think, even puts it more bluntly. He says in James 2, there will be no mercy. That's a powerful statement. For those who have not shown mercy to others, but if you have been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you. Whoa, what a powerful statement nestled there in the book of James that if we're to receive mercy, we need to extend it to others. And we know this. God grants us and gives us characteristics and traits, not to just hold it for ourselves, but honestly to shine forth and extend to others. People need to receive mercy, but it only starts first off when we receive the wonderful, amazing mercy of God. I want to end with this verse that Paul writes in Ephesians. He says, look, God is so rich in mercy. I feel like we could end right there. God is so rich in mercy and he loved you so much. He loved you so much that even though you and I were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. This is what he did for us. He extends that to us. We had nothing but by the mercy of God, we literally have life and the justice that we probably, the judgment we do deserve, God's taken upon himself for you and I. What a gift. So I pray as you go this day and this week that you see Joshua 9. Don't begin to presume upon God. Don't begin to be deceived. Don't allow self-deception to take root in your life. And again, throw yourself at the mercy of God. And as you do, you'll be able to extend it freely to others because you'll realize what a great gift it is. Bow your heads with me. Father, we are so thankful and gracious for what you've done for us. Nothing that we've earned could have done anything, but we thank you for the mercy that you've given us. We thank you for this day, and I pray your blessing on each and every person and their households hearing this, that you will just be, bring peace, hope, and life everywhere they go this week. In the name of Jesus, amen, amen, amen. Thank you so much for joining us this day, and I cannot wait to see you.